straight ahead on 12 News, a Grammy Award-winning songwriter teams up with local college students and gets a pleasant surprise. I'm, I'm stunned at the talent. Then, a planting effort in Plymouth that really sees the forest for the trees. But first, the investment in all-day kindergarten and what it means for two local school districts. 12 News starts right now. Schools across the state now have the option to provide all-day kindergarten at no additional cost to the district. Today, Governor Mark Dayton signed the education bill that invests $134 million in all-day kindergarten. Delane Cleveland has more now on what that'll mean for two local school districts. Yeah, I do. Kindergarten at Earl Brown Elementary School is a mixture of learning and hanging out with our friends and playtime. We need to tie them. Mixed with a little artistic expression. Making tie dye shirts. <laughs> it's also an all day affair and has been for the past 12 years. It's attractive. We, we attract a lot of kids from other districts that want all day. 178 kids take part in the all day kindergarten program at no additional cost to parents. When you're 80% poverty, uh, Fee-based is prohibitive and, and, you know, our goal has been as a community school district and before that to give every child equal opportunities. That means the cost comes from the school's general fund to the tune of $300,000 a year. This is a priority. Principal Jane Ellis calls it money well spent. It allows teachers the ability to expand upon content. Uh, it helps us identify kids who are struggling at an early age. It just has multiple rewards for us in getting to know the learner. And now that the state has decided to fund all-day kindergarten, the district will soon have more money to spend on general education. It would be to put our librarians back in the building. A full day offers, I think, a lot more. Meanwhile, in the Robbinsdale School District... We're really excited that, that uh, full-day kindergarten is going to be uh, funded for Minnesota students. District officials yeah, say they're excited, but they have some planning to do. We're in the very early stages of doing space analyses and, you know, facilities analyses and, you know, taking a, a, a good look at our enrollment, our, our enrollment projections to find out what this is going to mean. Nearly 400 students are enrolled in full-day kindergarten at Robbinsdale Schools, which costs their parents roughly $3,000 a year. Now we have fully funded all-day kindergarten coming. But by 2014, year, it won't cost uh, them a cent. It's easy. Back in Brooklyn Center, school officials are thrilled about what this means for the next generation of students. What we see is that kids are better prepared for the education system if they come through a full day K. The all day kindergarten program will fully go into effect in the fall of 2014. And Mike and Alex, the bill signed by the governor today increases education funding in the state by a total of $485 million. So a lot of happy educators out yes. there. All right. Thank you very much, Dwayne. Mm -hmm. Oh, there's disappointment in Maple Grove after the state legislature did not approve a plan to help redevelop the city's gravel mining area. City officials wanted lawmakers to approve a tax increment financing district to spur development along Elm Creek Boulevard. They say the land, though, is very flat and has water drainage issues, making it unattractive to developers. City Administrator Al Madsen says politics played a role in the plan not getting approved, even calling the process scary. It's a um, textbook example of politics, um, favoritism, um, lack of vision. I guess I could go on and on, but there are children here in the audience tonight, so <laughs> I'll, keep my com I'll keep my comments brief. So. Uh, Madsen says the city will regroup and figure out what to do next. Hennepin County prosecutors say there is finally some closure in a crime that killed a five-year-old Brooklyn Park boy. Nearly a year ago, Nizel George was asleep on his grandmother's couch in Minneapolis when bullets tore through the front wall of the house, hitting him in the back. 16-year-old Julian Anderson is the second to plead guilty to second-degree murder. He was sentenced to 28 years in prison. A first-degree murder charge was dropped as part of a plea agreement. Earlier, 17-year-old Stefan Shannon pleaded guilty, saying the shooting was intended as a gang retaliation. In Brooklyn Park, point-of-sale inspections are going away. The question now is when. City Council directed staff to come up with a way to get rid of the controversial inspection program used when a home is sold. Those against it say it holds up Brooklyn Park homeowners from selling their home. Those for it say it's a tool to improve blighted properties. I truly believe that this has done a lot for our housing stock. Um, I think we have, I've seen 
two of them on my own block. I don't know that the point of sale is, is really what caused people to come in and buy houses and fix them up. I don't believe that, that that's what caused people to do that. I think they were getting a good deal on the house because it needed work. Those against also argue the program has done nothing to maintain housing values in the city, pointing to the drastic de decline since the program went into effect in 2007. Well, two years ago today, a deadly tornado hit Golden Valley and North Minneapolis. One of the hardest hit areas was North Tyrol Park. The tornado tore through the park, tossing big mature trees around like twigs. At least 50 trees were destroyed. Today, the park, though, has a brand new look. The playground has been rebuilt and new trees are taking root. And just last week, more trees were planted in the park. The DNR gave the city a grant to buy trees while residents collected about $25,000. I think primarily it was a major aesthetic improvement for the entire neighborhood, uh, kind of uh, before and after the effect. Uh, the neighborhood being able to organize and plant such nice trees really improved the aesthetics of the entire park. The city says there was some money left over from the tree fund, which will now be used to build a trail in the park. Speaking of trees, there is a brand new forest that's taking root in Plymouth. The city held a tree planting event in the Northwest Greenway to celebrate Arbor Day and the 20th anniversary of the city's volunteer program. Renee Bonneau shows you how helpers, though, got a bit more than they signed up for. What I'm going to do is we're going to start here. About 150 volunteers answered the call, fill six acres of land with 16 varieties of trees. We've got dogwoods and ironwoods and lindens in there so far. It proved to be no easy task. Today there's a few mysteries. Volunteers initially thought the challenge was planting a thousand trees, but the real challenge? This is pretty wet. I should have worn some rain boots. Some other people brought some tennis shoes, which uh, are kind of realizing that yes, it's a little bit wetter than we thought. The conditions didn't just make it hard to get around, it added an extra step. The holes are filled with water, uh, so instead of planting the trees and then watering the trees, we're actually using the buckets to take the water out of the holes. So we don't have to worry about watering, but we do have to worry about the water that's here. <laughs> I think it looks very good. Despite the lack of sun, these guys found a bright side. It wasn't too hot and it wasn't storming, making conditions good enough to get the job done. It definitely is not as... Uh, it's easy as it could be, but then again, what can we expect in Minnesota? In Plymouth, Renee Bonneau, 12 News. Plymouth's forester said today's conditions were actually perfect for the trees. Too much wind or heat can damage newly planted trees. Not so hot for the people, good no. for the trees. <laughs> but coming up, something that may be driving you nuts. 12 News Money Savers tackles hidden fees up next. And then later in sports, Maple Grove plays for a spot in the State Boys Tennis Tournament. But first, could it really be? Your AccuWeather forecast shows no rain on Thursday. A recent study says 9 out of 10 people just skim over bills for major purchases. What they might miss is something called gray charges or hidden fees that are completely legal. Reporter Shannon Slatton shares how to identify and erase those gray charges in today's Money Savers. Most Americans carry more than three debit or credit cards in their wallet every day. And fewer people are paying close attention to the statements from all of those credit cards. The result, something called gray charges that can creep up and cost you money. Gray charges are a new, uh, sneaky, unwanted, but totally legal uh, bunch of charges that can really, really add up. They're buried in the fine print. Skip Johnson, a financial advisor at Great Waters Financial in New Hope, says you can blame it on our increasingly busy lifestyle. These companies are smart, they know we're busy, and because of it, they're making added profit, um, sometimes at our expense. Most gray charges are relatively small. Twelve, fifteen, eighteen dollars a month. Although it quickly adds up, it's easy to miss. In fact, Johnson discovered gray charges today. It looks like $29.99 of charges and $3.99 of charges. When he was preparing for our story. I'd traveled internationally and now my cell phone bill, apparently I've been signed up for a couple months for a global plan. I thought it was a one-time thing. Here are five types of gray charges to watch out for. Unknown subscriptions, which is a box you might or might not have checked when making an online purchase. Zombie subscriptions, which is something you might have canceled, like a gym membership, but it's still showing up on your statement. It's probably an oversight on the company's end, 
they're not purposely charging you. But if you don't notice it, and if you don't call them out on it, uh, that may be a lot of money you end up wasting. Auto renewals of products or services that are sometimes hard to stop. Then free trials, which often are not free after a few months. If you have to do a free trial that comes with giving them your credit card information, there's probably a catch. Finally, cost creep, where you've signed up for a subscription for one price, but it slowly creeps up. It's really pay attention, pay attention, pay attention. While this type of charge might be something new, the way to avoid gray charges is anything but. Read your bills and take action if something isn't right. Pay attention to the fine print. And finally, remember, nothing is free. For Money Saver, Shannon Slatten, 12 News. All right, good to know. Still ahead, he helped write songs for artists like Faith Hill. Later in the show, meet the songwriter now helping North Hennepin students. But first up in sports, highlights from opening day of the Northwest Suburban Conference Track and Field Championships. John Jacobson is in next. Another good outing for Maple Grove Tennis, and now on to the state tournament. Yeah, a great outing for them. Uh, Tough match against a very good team, but they uh, survived in advance. Maple Grove spent a lot of years chasing teams like Moundsview when it came to playoff time and boys tennis. Last year, the Crimson broke through to beat the Mustangs in the Section 5AA championship. They had a rematch for the 2013 section title. At number one single, Zach Atkins for Maple Grove. Jacob Bartels for Moundsview. Atkins gets the point with a nice live shot over Bartels. Later, Bartels tries to serve and volley, but a Wicked passing shot by Atkins wins the point, and he wins in straight sets. Two singles, Charlie Atkins serving for Maple Grove. That sets up the backhand winner. Jake Tronson serves for the Mustangs. Atkins will win the point with a great touch volley, and he wins 6-2, 6-1. At number three singles, Maple Grove's Sam Hochberger will crack a perfect passing shot on Hunter Krebsbach. And Hochberger wins the match. First doubles, Derek Marvin, Marvin serving for Maple Grove. And his partner, Trevor Kleinshay, will get the smash winner for the Maple Grove point. For the Mustangs, Austin Wiegers and Griffin Anderson win the battle 7-6, seven, 7-6. Six, seven, six. Still, Maple Grove sweeps all four singles matches. And the Crimson is section champion for a second straight year. The Section 6-3A softball tournament postponed its Tuesday games because of rain. It was play on, though, in Section 5-3A. Top seed Maple Grove beating Champlin Park. A good start for the number nine seed Rebels. Kara Stuckbeyer singles to left field. Maggie Craig comes home with the run, and it's 1-0 Rebels in the first. But Maple Grove responds with a huge bottom of the first. Taylor Bratton walks with the bases loaded to score. Josie Rail. It's 2-1 Grove. Gabby Oakley walks five batters in the first inning. Brianna Basil rips a pitch down the line and left here. This one goes all the way to the fence. Emily Z uh, Zimmer and Sarah Southern score. Maple Grove leads 4-1 on Basil's double. Next batter, Michelle Gorsett, and she comes through with a run scoring hit to right center. Taylor Bratton and Basil score. Maple Grove goes up 6-1 after one inning. That's plenty of run support for Maple Grove pitcher Sidney Smith, who strikes out 11 in the game as Maple Grove beats Champlin Park 8-4. And it sets up a winner's bracket matchup between Maple Grove and Coon Rapids. Rogers and Irondale meet in the other winner's bracket game. Champlin Park meets Tutino Grace in an elimination game, both those games Thursday in Shoreview. It's conference championship week for track and field athletes in the Northwest Suburban Conference. Highlights from a rainy day one of this meet. This is Joe Stevens of Champlin Park in the shot put. Stevens' best toss, 54 feet, 10 inches. He wins the title four and a half feet ahead of the runner-up. Creighton Daniels of Park Center in the triple jump. Daniels takes first place for the Pirates at 46 feet, two and a half inches, two feet ahead of the second place finisher. Brianna Puckett of Osseo sets the meet record in the long jump last season, this year, Puckett leaps 15 feet, 3 and a half inches to tie for fourth place. Girls discus, Linnea Tucker of Armstrong has a best of 80 feet, 5 inches. The jumping events were moved indoors because of the rain. Madison Ordner of Maple Grove clears 5 feet here to tie for third place in the high jump. Brendan Enright of Maple Grove clears 11 feet, 5 inches in the boys' pole vault. 
His best is 11-11 and he ties for first. Day two of the meet is Thursday with most finals in track events again at Coon Rapids. The Maple Grove and Elk River boys lacrosse teams tried to play in a snowstorm back in late April before calling it quits that night. The rescheduled game was Tuesday in the rain. Third quarter, Ben Schreifels picks up the ground ball and fires a goal for the Crimson. Fourth quarter, David Corazawa runs from behind the Elks net and sets up Joe Doman for the shot and goal. And it's Jake Wilson making a run to the goal and bouncing in a low shot here. This one is all Maple Grove. Corazawa finally patient on this one, looks around for a pass, and then waits and shoots it in himself for another Maple Grove goal. Crimson roll to the victory. 11-1 is the final. It wasn't his best day today, but a former high school baseball standout from the area is excelling at the collegiate level. Osseo High School graduate Tom Wendell got the start on the mound today for the Gophers against Illinois in the opening game of the Big Ten Baseball Tournament at Target Field. Wendell was named a first-team All-Big Ten selection this week. He entered the tournament with a 6-4 record and 2.05 ERA. Although he struggled with his control today, Wendell pitched five innings in the 3-2 win over Illinois, getting a no decision. The Gophers play again Thursday in the Big Ten Tournament. So he's uh, really had a great career there for Minnesota. All right. Thanks a lot, John. Thank you, John. Still ahead, a Grammy Award-winning songwriter returns to his roots. Up next, find out how he's helping create a tune at North Hennepin this week. We'll be right back. Well, finally, his songs have been recorded by the likes of Faith Hill, Nancy Griffith, and Kathy Matea. And this week, Brooklyn Center native and Grammy Award-winning songwriter John Vesner returns to his roots to work with local students at his alma mater. That is a song titled Trust Yourself, written and performed by students at North Hennepin Community College along with John Vesner. Vesner himself attended North Hennepin in the early 1970s before going on to become a Grammy Award winner. He's back to help the students record this single, which they hope to use as a fundraiser for the college. Vesner says the student's song has an important message about being yourself in a society that often follows a cookie cutter mold. We're sort of in this uh, American Idol, uh, you can be a star uh, where you need to look this way. But the ones that really stand out are the ones that, that stand up for themselves and stand out as themselves. The students will record their song with Vesner on Thursday at a Minneapolis studio. And he is back in the very same classroom where he learned music. So neat very for him cool. to record. That was about only half the, half the band. 14 students at North Hennepin. So yeah, it sounded good. And only half of them there in our, when we were there. Yeah, it'll, it'll be fun to hear the rest of them. <laughs> that does it for us. We'll see you tomorrow.